everybody. This is Tammy von Nordheim. I'm a mental health therapist, and I'm coming to you with Tuesdays with Tammy every Tuesday at 10 a.m. So please be sure to, uh, once you watch the shows, to like, comment, and subscribe, and make sure you turn on those notifications so that you don't miss an episode. And one more thing, I want to ask you if you please share my show with everybody that you know, because I'm on a mission to try to normalize conversations around mental health wellness, mental health awareness, and mental health therapy. So my guest today is going to be Hank Stewart. We've seen him last week, and I have him on again this week because our conversations are always so rich and full of great information, and uh, we just really want to share that with everybody. So everybody, please welcome Hank Stewart. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me again. This is this is fun. I, I, I I'm about to just start crashing your show every week. I'm gonna just start crashing it. <laughs> yep, yep. That that will be fine with me because I mean, you know, hey, if if the vibe is good and we are doing great things in our communities, I mean, it's always a good thing, right? So, um, mm-hmm. I think any time that you know we can do something positive. We should continue it. Why end it? Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So last week we talked about the um, the situations with police brutality and how it um, how we could see police reform, like what that would look like for us. So for this week, I would like to talk about how we as black people and other people who are non-black specifically white people. But you know what? I don't want to leave out other nationalities because I I sometimes feel like they are getting a pass, um, a pass to be able to stay silent because they are not white or black, right? But this is not a time for them to stay silent either. And I also want to talk about um, society. Like what can society do to help right this wrong in history and to help create a more positive shift in the world in general. So welcome to the show. Let's jump right in. Well, again, thanks again for having me. Look, that's a powerful question. I think, you know what? I think our children are getting it right. When I looked at, when I joined a lot of the protests that I've been out in for the last, you know, few weeks, um, I'm seeing black, white, brown, Asian yes, kids yes. together. So they're getting it right. It's, yes. it's really on us not to get it right. We, we got to get it right. Um, our young people are, they're so amazing, you know, they, they respect, and I think, and I think the beauty is when you don't know about, when you have, when you haven't taken the time to learn about someone else's culture, you have really deprived yourself. There is so much richness in every culture, in right. every culture, right? you know, and so I think when we start to, you know, start to look at other cultures and other cultures look at us, then they can have an opportunity to see how, you know, how beautiful our lives are too, and how rich our history is as, as well. I mean, and so, you know, sometimes, you know, and I, and I love when I go to Busy Bee and I see white folks sitting there eating soul food. You know what I mean? Because you, 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 you're you kind of leaking over a little bit to our, our culture. You, we see the music, that they enjoy our music. You know, so I think we, we miss an opportunity. When you don't want to know something about somebody else, you're missing an opportunity to learn a little bit more about them and even yourself. Uh, and so I think those two pieces are real crucial. I think our children are getting it right. And I think if we take the time to learn about somebody else, you know, because we are, you think about it, we have more in common than we have different. Mm-hmm. Really, the only thing that we really have different is our skin tone, right. right? We bleed the same way. Your organs work the same way. You walk the same way. You drive the car the same way. You, you know what I mean? It, we have more in common than we have different. Mm-hmm. The only thing that really, if you took our skin tone away from us, you wouldn't be able to tell each anybody anybody from, from anyone because you're gonna see the same heartbeat, right? Yeah. You're gonna see the same vein. You're gonna see everything that looks the same, and you could, you know, it's not a difference. Yep, yep, exactly. You know what? I I wanted to touch on this, and I meant to touch on it in our last week's show. I like the fact that you are acknowledging and um, bringing forth, um, you know, reminding us that the young people are who are really getting it right and that we literally failed them. And so I want to talk about how, how I think that we failed them. And I think it's because our parents, parents, our grandparents had gotten through some of the more tougher times um, after, you know, their parents had been freed. And I believe that 
we had gotten to a place of, you know what, it's a whole lot better than it used to be. I'm not even going to complain. I'm not going to say anything because like we know what they went through. Let's just let, you know, it'll probably change on its own. And so they stayed complacent and they were like, well, we still don't want to ruffle any feathers because they might wake up and decide that like the beast might come out again. So they, they mm -hmm. quiet, they kept it chill, if you want to say. And then our parents came along. They did more of the same because their parents did not teach them you know what? You're going to have to speak up and you're going to have to speak out and you're going to have to teach people how to treat you and you're going to have to do all these other things. I will say there were some people who were woke, but overall, we were still just trying to figure things out. Or, or I say we, our parents were still just trying to figure things out and figure out how can they live alongside the people who used to enslave their parents and their grandparents. Then you and I, our generation came along and because we didn't have a whole lot of people still teaching us to teach people how to treat us, um, uh, recognize when somebody's being disrespectful and that we have a right to speak up about it, um, and teaching us about different areas in our lives that where we could actually make a significant change. Again, we like dormant. We, we, we didn't want to shake things up. And so it's not that we weren't aware. It's just that well, you know what? The little bit of history they were teaching us sounds like, I mean, things were crazy. Nobody was, nobody's been burning a cross in our yard, you know, these last 10, 15, 20 years. Nobody's been, you know, hanging a black man at the downtown square and everybody's standing around cheering. So we were like, we kind of come a long way. But, you know, in the generation that's happening right now, the beast is bubbling up again and we're, we, we become smarter. We've started to realize the systemic racism. We've started to recognize um, how they've been literally keeping us and holding us back. And there's more of us now that are starting to speak up and say, you know what? That's not right. We're tired of this. And then all the people that were being killed by these white cops when either they weren't armed or they were no threat. We're just like, you know what? That's one too many. One is one too many. But you guys are consistently doing this. So we're going to start speaking up more. And so now the George Floyd just, you know, had everything explode. I mean, even white people were like, what just happened? So I feel like I'm so proud of the young generation for stepping up because the few times that I've gone out to protest, I just look around at the diversity and I hear these these young white girls and boys and, and then, you know, there's black, young black girls and boys. And then I've seen some, uh, um, some uh, Indians, I think it was, um, just other races in general. And they're yelling, black lives matter. And they're, you know, they have all these awesome signs. And, you know, and you look at the crowd of people, or at least I was looking at the crowd of people and it was like, you know what? If we were just hanging out in a park, I would never put this entire crowd together. There's different mm -hmm. age ranges. There's different styles and energies and vibes and flows. You know, you just wouldn't say, oh, yeah, I'd see all of them at the same bar. I'd see all of them at the same restaurant mm -hmm. because we were all so different. But the one mm -hmm. thing that we were all unified with was that Black Lives Matter and that it was wrong to um, to inflict such violence and, and hold, so, uh, hold this group, this race of people back just because of racism. And that think, um, yeah, was huge, huge. I, 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 think, uh, I think you hit it on the head again. Um, for, for me, I think one of the things that I think we did a horrible job of, and when I say we, uh, my, our generation, we stopped talking about our history. So we, exactly. didn't, we, we didn't understand what it looked like when we saw, let me, let me give you an example. If you, when you saw Trayvon Martin's death, it automatically should have it automatically should have made you think about Emmett Till. Yeah. Right. Because they, it was it was a similar situation when you felt when you when you hear Colin Kaepernick take a knee, um, a, a, a you know a silent protest, you got to think about Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so if you don't understand your history, so you'll be hard pressed to find a Jewish child that does not know. I mean, it's not oh, they're not. They're not focusing on where we're, where we're going now, but you're not going to forget about where you come from. You know, right. one of my favorite movies is a movie called Down in the Delta. You ever see the movie Down in the Delta? It's a great movie. 
And it's with Alfred Woodard, uh, Wesley Snipes is in it. I want to say um, the late Maya Angelou is in it. It's a phenomenal movie. And it's about this, uh, it's about this family who's fighting over a candelabra. They're fighting over a candelabra. So you wonder why, what is so special about this candelabra? And everybody, when they get mad at each other, they say, well, give me the candelabra. They, they're fighting over the candelabra. Every time when somebody's leaving, they want the candelabra. And at the end, they finally tell the story to the children why the candelabra was so important. It was their great, great, great granddaddy who was sold for a candelabra to another slave owner. Wow. And so when the grandfather, the great, great grandfather uh, escaped, he went by the master who sold him for the candelabra and got it and took it with him. And so what he did was, so the storyline that, that uh, every generation knew about the candelabra and it became very powerful and, and important to them. When you talk about your, your past, it's not, it's not handcuffing you there, it's just keeping you to the point that you remember it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we did a horrible job. We didn't want to, like, you know, when you hear Jay-Z say, we're beyond kneeling, or we're beyond protesting, this generation, no, we're not. And that's a part, it's in a major part, and it's because of kneeling and protesting, the reason why you're seeing a chokehold um, legislation now in Minneapolis. You saw the uh, Breonna Taylor bill that's passed in Kentucky. You see a whole legislative caucus come out with, with, with Kente Clause on and passing all type of legislation. You got a hate crime bill in Georgia being introduced that had never been introduced before. So it's the kneeling, it's the protesting, it's the marching, it's the picketing. All of that is what did it. And then I think the other thing that I would like to see Caucasians do with other Caucasians, we ain't got to be around when we do this, but you got to check each other. Yes. You know, you got to check, you got to check each other. Like when Drew Brees, you got to check each other, you know, uh, and his, uh, his fellow coworkers checked him and they said, look, wait a minute now, hold up. We, 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 we're, we're in the grind together. We go to a, a, a hard training camp together. You, you, we high five each other and dap each other as brothers. And we, you know, I'm laying off of balls that are overthrown, but I want to catch this ball for you and for the team. Right. And, and so when we walk off the field, you go in a different direction and you're not harassed by the police officers and I might make it home. Mm -hmm. you with me? So I think, you know, I sit on a board called National Juvenile Defender Center. And it's actually out of D.C. And it's to make sure that every child that goes before the juvenile court system has fair and competent representation. And one of the things that I love about that organization is it's predominantly white, but they're very conscious, Tammy. They're very conscious people. I mean, they're very conscious. And they fight. Sometimes I think they fight harder for black kids than some black parents like fight for their own children. You know, they, they, I've seen them get really, really mad about situations. And so one of the things that I love about that is that we can check each other. Yeah. You know, we can yeah. check each other. And, 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 and check each other is love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you love somebody, the Bible even talks about, you know, you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Parents who don't discipline their children obviously don't love their children because you discipline your children because you love them. Mm -hmm. So to be able to check each other, mm -hmm. you know, really mm -hmm. makes all of us better. You know, so, yeah. you know, that's that's what I see about that. Yeah. And so, you know what, you, that was a, that's a good segue into the next um, question I wanted to ask you. I wanted to, us to talk about, like, what, because I had, know there's a lot of white people with this question. Um I just finished speaking at a Woodstock Black Lives Matter here recently, and um, a young white lady came up to me and said, I want to ask you, like, what can I do? What can I do differently? And I was so proud of the fact that she came up and she gave me examples and instances and everything, and, um, and I was able to share with her my thoughts. But I think a lot of white people probably have this question, and if they don't have it, they should have this question. And so... Um, I want to talk about like one or two things, of course, there's a lot of things, but one or two things that we can suggest that they can do. And the one thing that pops out for me the most is to um, not pretend it's not happening. That's the biggest thing. Um, I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Hell, it's made us very uncomfortable for a long time, but you cannot let your, your discomfort, um, feel or, or become complacency in this situation um, because your silence really is compliance. And so um, I think just for the fact that they just should not pretend it's not as bad as it is or pretend it's not happening is huge. The first thing I would tell them to do is if you have black friends, black neighbors, maybe even black family, Say something to them. Just say, acknowledge that you even know, that you even understand the significance of what is going on now in the world. For you to just say, 
hey and give me a hug or you know say have talk to you in a while it's so good to see you or um whatever that means nothing if we end up talking for 30 minutes to an hour in today's day and you don't mention one time how i'm um, you know what's going on right now really sucks i mean you don't have to have a solution because uh, we're still working on solutions but if you don't even acknowledge that you are aware of it how do you think that makes us feel right I, just I think, I think, I think, so i think i think you, those are again awesome points i think if you you know you're complicit if you if you're not fighting you're you're, you're in support of it i think i think caucasians can do a better job of fighting for public education Mm -hmm. Keeping public education because that that's a that's a really good foundation for our children. You know, don't fight to take your kids and take money away from public education. Fight to make sure that all children are being served and educated. You know what I mean? Change the curriculum. Make sure that your child, your your children and grandchildren are learning about African American history, mm -hmm. not just history, right? Because right? right. then you understand you understand that piece. I think we need to go to church together. Yes. You know, Sunday. Sundays are one of the most segregated days of the week. Now, you know, a lot of African Americans go to Caucasian churches, but you don't see a lot of Caucasians going to African American churches. You know, right. like the Buckhead Church, I love the Buckhead Church. Andy Stanley is an amazing, you know, so you see you can go to that church and see a lot of blacks in there, right? But do you go and see a lot of blacks in, you know, in a predominantly with a black preacher? You don't see that as much, you know. So I think we need to, they need to come to church with us and see see our, you know, our religion. And I think workplace, I think there's too many occasions where Tammy has, when they know Tammy should have been promoted mm -hmm. and they overlook her for the promotion. Mm -hmm. Too many cases, she, you know she should be leading this department. She's capable. She put the time in. She's got the education. And yet well, you I, bring I, someone I, off I, the street. Yes. You bring someone off the streets and you put, you ask Tammy to train her and then she's Tammy's boss. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, all of that kind of, all of that plays a factor in and the hostility and the anger and the you know and and what really pisses us off is black folk. You know we're better. We you know the the fact that we have to be smarter, stronger. You know everything is true. And so I think that's the part. You know when I when I I'm listening to your credentials, right? People should be knocking your door down. Coming, I mean you 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 should be a TV show host, a national because you got the credentials, the look, you have the intellect. You, you understand? You've done all the work. And yet, it's harder for you to get the to get the break. Right. You know what I mean. Right. So, right. I, so I think you know if they really want to help, then start recommending some of your more than qualified friends that you know who are more than qualified for those jobs to get them, and say, you know what, I would like because me personally, Tammy, if I'm not equipped to do something, and I know there's someone else better than than me to do it, I will recommend you. I would say, look, you know what, I would love to have this opportunity. But let me tell you who really would, and I've said that on many, let me tell you who would kill this topic that you want right now. Call Dr. Linda this, call Dr. John this, call somebody, because if I want you to have the best program, and I want somebody who can really add substance to your program. Yes. Well, it should be the same, and I know we don't want to give up another $50,000 on the job, but too many on too many occasions, black folk, particularly black women, are overlooked mm -hmm. in promotions, you know, and black men are, you know, so I, I would love to see, those are three things, I would love to see, a, I would love to see Caucasians help us fight for public education. I like to see us go to church together, and I like to see them not being complicit in jobs. Right. And That's great. You know what? And when you talked about the job thing, there is someone that I know personally, and because I have not asked permission to share publicly this information, I'm not going to mention any names. But someone was on a job for 18 years running the job, and a position was created. I think it was created that would have been a step above them, but just under like director. And they, um, and the person that was in on the job for like 18 years doing it a, very well, lots of accolades in the community, everything. She was um, overlooked for the position. They brought in a white woman who didn't have the experience at all. This person, the black woman, had to train the white woman to take this position where the white woman would have been her boss. And it's mm -hmm. just like, you know, and I know this person, they went through the EEOC, you know, complaining, fought for the job, you know, eventually, you know, they, they got exhausted and it became very expensive. And 
you know, and the, their their spirit was breaking because they mm-hmm. knew they deserved that. The director and the people above them knew that she deserved that. Yet they overlooked her to give it to a white woman who was less mm-hmm. experienced. And the white woman had the nerves to be kind of have like attitude too. But anyways, um, so the person ended up uh, quitting. I think she maybe got like um, uh, a settlement or something because, you know, she was going to sue. But she was exhausted. And, mm-hmm. you know, and money had, you know, run out and it was just exhausting to the spirit. So, yeah, I love the fact that you used that as one of your three points for white people. Speak up in the job workplace. You know, um, everybody else in this person's job, they knew she deserved it. They would tell her privately behind closed doors. You should mm-hmm. you should get that. I don't know why they're doing it, but they weren't speaking up. You got to speak up for your your coworkers, your friends. And so mm-hmm. um, to that, I'd like to say that another thing that I think white people can do, and I had, I had made a list of things um, as talking points for something else I was going to speak on. Employers, CEOs, owners, founders, if you have, well, hopefully you've got a diverse uh, group of people working for you. But if you know that you've got, say, for example, 10 employees, five black, five white. Your five white employees, no matter what level they're on in the company, make more money than the five black employees. Don't even ask. Don't wait till there's a time for it's time for an evaluation. Go ahead and automatically give the black, the five black employees a raise to match the white employees. You don't have to make some big announcement. You can even say to the the black employees, listen. This is how I feel like we can contribute to trying to make what's wrong in the world right. But this is not something I'm trying to go out and announce. I mean, nobody has to tell anybody. Nobody give has them to a, know, right. No, right. give them a raise because they will know it. And this, mm-hmm. and then also a lot of corporations, a lot of um, even like doctor's offices or whatever, they'll write these letters and they'll put it on their website. We stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, blah, 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 blah. But what else are you doing? What else have you done? What else are you going to do? Because you're putting a letter on your website is mute if there's no action behind it. You know what I mean? If you have not looked at the, um, the, uh, the, the, the money that you're paying your employees to try to see how imbalanced it might be, If you um, are not going out into the community and physically protesting and everybody doesn't have to do that. I understand that there's some situations that it just doesn't work. If you are not um, donating money to a cause that's going to support Black Lives Matter, um, police reform, um, whatever. If you're not doing anything else, if you're not. If you're not having meetings with your staff and your employees and speaking out against, like, I don't want to, I want to make sure I don't ever hear anything or catch anybody saying certain things, doing certain things, you know what, to make them clear on where you stand, then your letter on your website means nothing. It's just simply lip service so that you look good until everything passes over, but you got to put some action behind those words that you had somebody else type up or you copy and pasted from somebody else and you just slammed it on your website. You might make a little tweet on Twitter. You know, maybe you have a Facebook page and you post it there, but what else are you doing? It's not enough just to post a letter. And I think, I think you, you have a foundation, right? You have yes, a, you I have empower a me too. Right? I think, I think Caucasian, I think a, a majority companies, should put somebody in minority who to to look for folk, not the usual suspects, not the, not not, the there's nothing league. wrong with the Urban League, you know, not the Urban League and NAACP. I get yeah. that. But go and find some of these grassroots organizations or foundations who yeah. are on the ground doing the work, you know, doing the hard work, you know. Yes. And and you know, and, and when there's times for grants and people are mad, you know, grants have gotten so strenuous. And I get it because, you know, some people have abused the grants on it, but you've made the, the grant process so tough. Right. That, that that small organizations, if they spend the time writing the grant, they don't spend the time helping the children. Mm-hmm. You with me? Mm-hmm. Because the grant process is so tedious and so true that you could be helping children by the grant. You understand? Right. And so what you have is you have all these Caucasian companies who have, you know, you have a company, you have a major company who will lend a grant writer to a small organization. 
so they can go out. So that, that grant writer is on payroll at a Fortune 500 company, but they're writing grants for a small organization. So the small organization can get the money. Does that make sense? Yeah. But a lot of these grassroots African American foundations and things who I, I know several who are on the ground grinding working hard they you know they're up before the sun of dawn a break of dawn and they're out on the street you know they're saving children they're doing and they don't have the resources to go out there and bite you know and write the grant you know and spend the time and so you know support so find these you know one of the things that oprah used to do that i thought was really cool was she was fine she was fine she would find those very unique stories go out and look have your company go out and find those unique stories yeah find the tam foundation and find the steward found it find these other uh, look at them you don't have to you don't have to jump on them right now look and see what they're doing stand back and look at the work and the impact that they have and bless them with something to keep on doing that work right mm -hmm. and so you know i think there there are so many things we can do uh if i ever get the opportunity that's that's gonna be my conversation because it seems as if the, the usual suspects always get the money yeah. you know what i mean the usual mm -hmm. and a lot of high overhead and all that and and it and the money barely if ever trickles down to the ground. Right, right. I agree. I agree. I like that because there are times, like I've had my foundation now for five or six years and it's called I Empower Me Too. But as I've looked into it further, trying to see how can I really get it going really well so that I can actually put forth um, some effort into making a significant change in the communities with mental health and with what my foundation stands for, with the homeless population, it's been very challenging because with everything, you need money, you need um, support, you might need labor, you might need volunteers, but you don't, you don't want to constantly ask somebody to do something for free because exactly, I mean exactly. they they have to like they have to support their families and do things and so you know it ends up drying up the pool of people who want to volunteer and sometimes mm -hmm. volunteers they don't even want to go volunteer for your foundation because it's not a big name yet so it's like how is that going to look on my resume even who's going to care if I say oh yeah I worked with you know that foundation it's like well I've never heard of them it's not about trying to grow the um, the foundation into like a household name, like, you know, NAACP or, or, you know, something like that. It's just simply about being able to help the people in the community from a grassroots um, foundation because you are trying to do good things in the community. And um, like you said, take a look at them, just even consider them. If you feel like this is a foundation that's going to squander money that you donate to them or that's going to um, just sit on it and not do anything, then yeah, make that decision at that time to, no, I'm going to pass on, I'm going to go someplace else. But you have to give somebody an opportunity to even be considered. And a lot of times the grassroots organizations can't even be considered because they can't even get their foot in the door because, the, like you said, the grant writing process is so tedious and so challenging that you have to have a degree in grant writing. And then the grant writers that you can potentially can potentially hire to do that are so expensive. It's like, exactly right. you know, and it doesn't and guarantee the grant and it doesn't guarantee, right. it doesn't guarantee the grant. Exactly. You know I mean? so, it doesn't. <laughs> so it's such a challenge. It really is. Um, but yeah, I think that you, you know, you made some great, uh, great suggestions before we wrap up this um, part of the show. I want to talk about, um, cause I know I was going to talk about, you know, what black people can do, what society can do and, uh, corporations and then what white people do. And I think we touched on corporations and we've touched on white people. We'll have to do a whole nother show, with, um, you know, um, black people in society, but let's, uh, give one or two pointers on, um, what we've seen white people do right. I don't want the show to just be like, Oh, let's just talk about all the negative because it's not always negative. I want to talk about what we've seen that they've done right. And one of the things, the first thing I want to mention is how it's actually the, in the, it feels different when I go out in public sometimes now I have like, I live, um, in, um, you know, the suburbs of, um, Atlanta, Georgia, I live in the suburbs of uh, North Fulton and, I tell you, when I've gone out and gone walking before, I've gone in restaurants or gone in the malls before pre-COVID, obviously, um, a lot of times people would just like not even really look at me. They would just go on about their business. And you think, 
but we're in the South and everybody's like supposedly so nice compared to like New York. But I swear, sometimes I'm thinking, you know, people act, act almost if they don't see me. And I'm thinking maybe it's because I'm in the suburbs, because when I'm in the city, it feels different. Like, you know, over in Decatur, all those areas, it feels like they actually might, you know, make more contact with me more often. Eye contact. Now, I will say um, that it's not everybody up here, but I felt it. And even with other black people, I was just like, but we're like the same. Come on. You don't want to like, like make eye contact and at least smile. But it's almost like we just avoid each other. What I've noticed different after uh, the COVID pandemic, you know, as we're venturing out a little bit, and especially after all this Black Lives Matter and police brutality has come out, I have just gone out on walks just down the street just to get some exercise and fresh air. And the people I've passed, which have been like, you know, the majority of white, like nine times out of 10, they've given me eye contact, they've smiled, they've nodded, they said, hi, they said, how are you? And they go on. And I was like, that, that was not happening before from older people to younger people. That is one thing that I see that they are getting right is just acknowledging that I even exist. And I just like, that feels good. I mean, I know we're not where we need to be yet, but I just want to say thank you because I can see, I can feel the difference. I can feel the change slowly shifting and that feels good. What yeah, I, I love it. Um, I have two, I have, you said two. Um, one is a guy by the name of Rick Baker. Rick Baker, uh, we laugh and joke, he, we call each other brothers. So Rick is a Caucasian. Rick, uh, when we met about four, three years ago, Rick became we became very good friends because one of the reasons why we became very good friends is because we could we we didn't come in looking to see what we can get from each other, but what we could bring to the relationship, to the friendship, right? So Rick was offering, you know, to help and I, and you know, I was offering to help. We had a great relationship, but w what I love about Rick is uh, his heart was in the right place. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like a really really cool dude, and and we have been. You know, so we'll talk. Matter of fact, he sent me more text messages. Uh, I'm talking about before Maude Avery. We, he was still saying, what can I do? What can, you know, what? And, and so he was really, he's always been on the ground. And I've seen him fund civil rights things, you know, help and, and you know, and things of that nature. His his, uh, his significant other is a young lady by the name of Mariela Rivera. And she is just equally as, as loving and powerful. I've done stuff with her. Um so, you know, so, I, you know, when I look at that, I start thinking that we have some very unique uh, relationships. And I think we have to, show, you know, the Bible says to, to be a friend, you must first show yourself friendly. So we got to make sure that we're equally as friendly as well, too. Exactly. Because uh, I think there are people who really want to reach out. But we don't, you know, sometimes our exterior. Now, I'm not talking about you because I know how your smile is, you know, is, is a part of your wealth. Uh, but some of us, we walk around looking like as if we just sucked on a lemon. You know, we don't want anybody to speak to us. We don't want to say anything. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta appear to want to be friendly, you know? Yes. And the other one I go back to the second thing that, you know, I, and I look at my national juvenile defenders family and I tell them often, I said, you know, one of my favorite quotes is a quote that says, it is the responsibility of the conscious to make the unconscious conscious of the unconscious behavior. Mm -hmm. It is the responsibility of the conscious to make the unconscious conscious of their unconscious behavior. And so we've made each other conscious. And, and so I think, you know, it, it's that thing where you have to gravitate, you gravitate to people who have a similar interest in making humanity better, you know, yeah. humanity better. And, um, and, and I see a little bit more of that. I think now people are having, they're feeling a little bit more empowered to do that. You know, they're, they're feeling as if they can separate from their friends, Tammy, and, and join and support and support this. Every march that I've been on, out of all six or seven marches I'm moving, I've seen equally just as many whites and Hispanics and Asian and, you know, uh, Indians in the in the march as well. Korean, I've seen just as many. And I'm loving it. I am absolutely loving it. So like you, it's empowering. <laughs> and I'm optimistic. I think we're heading around, down the right track right now. We just oh. got to keep it going. We can't be a 10-day people like Dr. King said. Keep it going. We got to keep 381 days. I always say this, 381 days. It was the Montgomery bus workout was 381 days. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot think this thing is over. We, we're just starting, but we got, you know, and the Montgomery bus workout was 381 mm -hmm. days. That's so we got to keep running. Look, look, we got time because we still waiting on that vaccine anyway, right?
Okay, yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. Right, right. Well, Hank, thank you so much for joining me again for another show. Uh, our conversations are always so great. And um, do you have any uh, parting words that you'd like to uh, share with everybody? Hmm. Any encouragement? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, first of all, I just want to thank you. I, you know, you, you could have chosen anybody to have this conversation with and definitely more people who are more qualified than me. And so thank you for thinking that I would fit, you know, be an addition to to this uh, platform. And um, and I just I just thank you. Uh, my parting words would be, in the end, I remember not the voice of my enemies, but the silence of my friends. And that's what Dr. King says. So if you're a friend, you know, make sure, you know, make sure people hear it. You know, so in the end, I remember not the voice of my enemies, but right. the silence of my friends. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. You know what? Maybe, um, maybe when we uh, have another show together, I can get you to recite one of your poems so that we can share that with the world. Hank has an amazing ability to capture beautiful words on paper and um, performing them is, is always a nice thing to watch him do as well. So anyways, thank you so much for coming on the show with me again today, uh, Hank. And I just want to leave a message with each of you. Um, thanks again for joining Tuesdays with Tammy. Um, we are on every Tuesday at 10 a.m., and I want to encourage you, once again, to be better today than you were yesterday and make sure that you are better tomorrow than you are today. Please subscribe and click that notification bell so that you won't miss any of our future shows. If you'd like to be on the Tuesdays with Tammy show, please uh, click on the link that's in the bio below and reach out to me and let's talk. All right. Thank you so much and have a great day. If you'd like to be a guest on Tuesdays with Tammy, please contact me at www.tammyvon.com.